So my name is Eduardo, and this is a joint work with uh, Sebastian Erdwerg, Guido Waxmuth, and Elko Vista, who is my uh, PhD supervisor, promoter. Uh, so principles synthetic code completion using placeholder. Uh, okay. So many IDEs have some support for, for code completion, right? So in fact, research has shown that for some IDEs, code completion is one of the most used tools inside the IDE. And there are two kinds of code completion. There is semantic code completion and synthetic code completion. And what you see is mostly semantic. So you trigger code completion inside a, an expression and you get all the method, methods that are available at that position, considering the type and name rules that you have in your language. But there's also semantic completion, which based on the cursor, uh, the proposals include the synthetic, or that there's also synthetic completion, uh, which based on the cursor, you get a list of proposals with structures of the language that are available at that position. And that's interesting because, well, the user can program faster, right? So you, you get a, a block of code at once, and for new users, they find out what's actually available uh, to insert at that position. So the language construct uh, to discover the language, right? And as I said in the beginning, our work is focused mainly on synthetic completion and as a building block to provide better semantic completion as well. Uh, so even though many IDEs have support for synthetic code completion, there are still some problems. So as you can see here, for example, in this list of proposals, there's a proposal for an else block, where if the user selects this else block, well, he gets a syntax error. So, and then we say that uh, the completion framework, the implementation for synthetic code completion is unsound. Whereas un soundness in this case means that the resulting program should have no additional uh, uh, syntax error, right? So, but there's also the case where this list of proposals is, is just uh, a few, contains just a few statements in the language. So, for example, in this program, I want to add a, an assignment to the program, and there's no synthetic proposal that allows me to do that. And for this reason, we say that the completion framework is incomplete, <laughs> right? Where completeness means that any program should be derivable through code completion. And as I said before, many IDEs have support for synthetic code completion. But in general, this implementation for synthetic code completion is just ad hoc. You have a, li a list of proposals for a few statements and things like that. And what language workbenches do is try to do this more in a principled way. So they derive uh, an IDE, so a textual or projectional IDE, based on the language specification. And in this case, if we consider uh, code completion based on, on the language specification, we derive synthetic and semantic code completion. But even though uh, language workbenches do it kind of in a principled way, they also suffer from the same problems that I mentioned before. So for example, in this case, xtex, you have a proposal here that if you select, it, you get a syntax error. And as I said before, this is unsound, right? So, and then the idea or the, the goal that we want to achieve is to, from a syntax definition, from a language specification, derive sound and complete synthetic code completion. Uh, so the list, the, the contributions of our work include uh, a general framework uh, uh, with definition for what is a sound and a, what is a, a complete uh, code, synthetic code completion. And Together with this, with this uh, formal definition for soundness and completeness and what, what actually means uh, synthetic code completion, we also have an implementation in SpoofX uh, using the language specification inside SpoofX. And I want to emphasize here that we are interested in generating a textual ID, even though our ideas are actually inspired by projectional, projectional ideas. So how do we do that? And the first idea that we come up is uh, called explicit placeholder. So what happened is, in an IDE, an incomplete program means that 
the program is missing something. So let's consider this, this is not Java, it's just a simplified version of Java, right? Uh, and here it's missing something, an expression to the, to the assignment. And whenever it's missing something, there's something missing, then we have a syntax error and the program is incorrect. So our idea is to actually have a, a valid representation for an incomplete program using placeholders. So we use these placeholders and we make incompleteness valid uh, using them. And these placeholders allows you allow us to actually produce code completion. So if you position the cursor inside the placeholder, you get a list of proposals with possible expansions for the program. You select one of them, the placeholder is replaced by one of uh, the expansions, and you can type and replace the placeholder. Right, and if you type again, you have a complete program uh, with a statement and fixing the program, the, the program, so the program doesn't have a syntax error. So, from using this approach, we can go from the program in the first box to the program in the fourth box by just doing code completion and replacing placeholders uh, at some point by lexical symbols. So, and like I said before, we want to derive this this syntactic completion from the syntax definition, right? Uh, so based on a general, so we implemented using STF3, but you can consider a, a general context-free syntax, EBNF, uh, in this case, right? Uh, and we want to get something like in, in the program on the bottom. So the first thing that we do is to make placeholders part of the language, right? And we do this by uh, generating a placeholder for from each non-terminal in the language. So whenever we can parse this non-terminal, we can actually parse a placeholder as well, right? So and then these placeholders can appear in the program whenever uh, we can parse the non-terminal that the placeholder represents. So we generate an extra placeholder rule for each non-terminal in the language. The second thing is. Uh, we need to define how to expand these placeholders, and we also generate these placeholder expansions from the syntax definition as well. So, in general, a production rule defines how a node in the AST is constructed, right? So, in this case, for, for the if statement, you have an if node with uh, subnodes, an expression, a statement, and a statement, right? So, and based on the signature for the AST, we construct the, the placeholder expansions. Right, so we construct an expansion for the statement placeholder that it's an if consisting of subnodes or children uh, that has placeholders as, as its children. So and then if we calculate this based on the rules of the syntax definition, well we parse placeholders, we expand placeholders and we, we format this somehow, uh, we get the placeholder expansions and we get code completion. Right, so now we have this diagram <coughs> where, like I said before, incomplete programs are now correct and we have complete programs. So you can use these placeholder expansions to expand incomplete programs. You can sometimes expand to, to something that it's not, that doesn't contain more placeholders. So at some point, if you keep expanding, you get a complete program either by expanding to, to uh, a proposal that doesn't have placeholder or by replacing lexical placeholders by typing. So, uh, but what about a program that doesn't have a placeholder? Right, so how, how do you expand them? Uh, and to do that, well, first, the first naive solution could be, for example, typing a placeholder. Right, so you type a placeholder, you position the cursor there, and you trigger code completion, and you expand the program. And you can do that, for example, to add an extends clause to this, to this class, or an add an, a statement to the list. But that's not really an a elegant solution, an, an elegant solution. So what we do instead, it's called placeholder inference. And we identify places in the program where expanding it doesn't generate syntax errors. And the two places that we identified are optional nodes and 
a list of statements. So you can add something to, to, to the list of statements or, or in this case, or add an optional parent. But the problem is, as I said before, with placeholders, you position the cursor inside the placeholder, you trigger code completion, you get a list of expansions. But for optional elements, well, there's no actually, uh, uh, the optional element is not there, so it's, there's, it's not possible to position the cursor inside the optional element if it's not there. And for list, well, the list, uh, the, the, the region for the list is actually the first character of the list and the last character of the list. So it's not really possible to add uh, an element as the first element or the last element of the list. Uh, so, and to do that, let's consider the program on the left and the uh, parse tree on the right, where AST nodes are, are circles, uh, ellipses, and squares or rectangles are parse tree nodes. And we use the notion of adjacency, where we figure out where the cursor is and the nodes adjacent to, to, to the cursor, and if it's an nullable node or uh, an optional node and there's no source region for this optional node, well, we are actually can expand the program at that position. So, for example, if the cursor is after the A here, then we can actually add the extend clause and similarly, if it's before the curly bracket, then we can also expand and add the extend clause. Right, so without a placeholder, we can actually add the extends clause. And similarly, uh, let's consider the same program, but now the method list. So we use the cursor. So if the cursor is uh, behind the first statement, well, we can find in the tree where exactly to add the statement. Same idea if it's uh, in the middle of the list and finally in the tail of the list. So we add a statement as the tail of the list. Right, so and then code completion and, uh, and formatting takes care of adding the statement as uh, to the program as the end of the list. Right, so now our diagram looks like this. So we have still have complete and incomplete programs as correct, but now you can use code completion to move from a complete program to an incomplete one. Right, so using placeholder inference, you add placeholder and you can continue code completion from there. And of course, you can also do that for an incomplete program, right? So programs that already have placeholders, but you want to add placeholders in a different position. <coughs> okay, that's fine. But now there's also the case of programs that don't, uh, that, that are missing more than a single placeholder, that there's uh, lexical symbols that are missing as well. So we call these incorrect programs. and. Have in mind that it's not all the set of incorrect programs, but programs that are that uh, that have some part of the input of something uh, in the program, right? So in this case, x here could be uh, part of the statement, right? So that's the class of programs that we are trying to provide code completion for. And in this case, we use error recovery. And we basically do what I said. So we use the X that it's already in the program to guess or to figure out what what can uh, what what kind of statements we can use this X as a starting point to fix the program to construct a valid statement, right? In this case, uh, we can use the X as the type of a variable decoration for this example toy language, Java-like language. So I notice that, as I said in the beginning, it's synthetic code completion. So we are producing a synthetic valid program. Even though X uh, is not a type, we want to have that as a result. And we can do the same thing for an assignment, using the X as the left-hand side of an assignment. And how do we do that? Well, we use the parser. And from the syntax definition, we derive insertion rules. So when the parser uses these uh, insertion rules to figure out where I can actually add a placeholder at the cursor position or try to add this placeholder without consuming any input. And if the parser can construct uh, a node, then it proposes that node to the user. 
And we use generalized parser that basically packs this, uh, these proposal nodes as ambiguities in the tree. So each uh, possible ambiguity or each, uh, each proposal node becomes a proposal to the user on how to fix the program. Right, so and, and proposal nodes are basically constructed using the insertion nodes. And uh, another thing that's worth mentioning is that we apply these insertion nodes, or these insertion rules only at the cursor. Because it's something that we want to complete, that it's already there. And moreover, we also don't create a proposal node based only on this insertion node. Otherwise, we would just could construct any node using this insertion node, and then our search for, for recoveries would explode, right? So uh, the interesting thing is that whenever we can recover a placeholder, we, we do that and not explore the search, uh, the, the, the solutions by constructing more deep trees. So another thing is that we use greedy recovery so we try to use as many symbols of the input as possible. Right? So in this case, there's a semicolon already in the program, so the parser doesn't try to, doesn't try to apply the insertion rules to, to figure out what is missing. And finally, um, it's also possible to construct nested proposal nodes, and they work like you, you use the insertion node to construct a proposal node, but it's not really enough because the program is still has a syntax error, it's still missing something, and we can use more insertion nodes to construct nested proposals, right? So in this case, for example, well, you need to fix the addition by adding a, uh, the, well, the plus sign there is wrong, but just the, the expression placeholder. Um, you need to add the, the expression placeholder to fix the addition, and you also want it, but that's not enough because that would result in a an, in an program with syntax error. So you need to use the insertion rules to, to, uh, to have the semicolon to fix the assignment as well. Right, so and that's what we call nested proposal nodes. So if we select that, we get the placeholder for expressions and the semicolon. So to summarize, uh, we have a, a, a valid representation for incomplete programs using placeholders. And notice that now we have complete programs as correct, and these incomplete programs are also correct. And we have the class of incorrect programs, uh, as I said before, the programs that are missing something. By placeholder expansion, uh, we can move from uh, an incomplete program to a complete program, or we can keep further and further expanding an incomplete program. Using placeholder inference, we can, from a complete program, generate uh, an expanded incomplete program, or we can also expand incomplete programs. And by error recovery, well, if, we, if your recovery only apply uh, insertion rules for lexical symbols, then you get a complete program. And if it recovers a placeholder, then we get an incomplete program. And com code completion continues from there. So as I said before, we use uh, Spoofx to uh, implement our solution as uh, an implementation. And from SDF3, we derive all these rules that I showed you before. And Spoofx allows to generate a textual IDE with support for synthetic code completion. And in our paper, we have proofs and definitions for soundness and incompleteness. So you can uh, go to our paper to get there. And our artifact has been evaluated and accepted. Thank you very much.